Let me resume recording. All right, we're now recording. Let me say shout out to everybody that's online this afternoon. Thanks for joining in. Um, this is always one of the more popular webinars of the webinar series that we do each year. And uh, today I expect uh, nothing different. Uh, we've got Dr. Brent Pemberton back with us. Uh, Brent is a professor and Regents Fellow uh, with the uh, uh, Texas A&M University. And Regents Fellow is a special designation. And that, that's, they don't give everyone that designation, a Regents Fellow. Yes, he's a jolly good fellow, but being a Regents Fellow means as he is uh, noted for being uh, one of the preeminent scholars in his field. And certainly uh, many of you know Brent personally, and uh, are, it's one of the reasons why you're here, because he, he not only knows his stuff, but he, he um, is willing to share information uh, far and wide. So Brent, thank you for being back. I don't know if this is the fifth or sixth year or seventh or eighth. Or, I've lost track now. Yeah, but something like that. We've been doing this for a very long time. Folks, I just want to remind you that I copied in two different spots in the chat box the website where I keep the recordings for these webinars. And you can see the last three are all related to Brent webinars. And the handout for today is at that particular website. So open up the chat box. And I'm going to copy it again right now as I speak. Click on that URL, and that's going to take you to the site that's on my Ellison Chair website. By the way, I'm Charlie Hall, the Ellison Chair in the Horticulture Department here at Texas A&M. But it'll take you to my site where these webinars are hosted, and the handout for today is on there. All right, so you'll have a handout of all the plant material that Brian is going to be talking about, plus for the first time ever, he has included the actual plant name on the slide. So that'll, that'll be a, a kind of a twofer in terms of being able to keep track of all the plants that Brent is going to talk about. So with that, Brent, I'm going to um, turn my video off and then the floor will be yours. So take it away, my friend. All right, thank you, Charlie. I really appreciate this. And um, we were just talking earlier about how this webinar has moved late in the season um, to so that really it's a, I'm able to talk more about current trial results um, and and uh, do things in a little bit more timely manner so that we can see what's actually happening this summer with a lot of these plant materials. Um, this picture that you're seeing here is the we did actually get to have a field day this year. Um, we did that on the 22nd of July. It was in the field only, and um, it was uh, it was early in the morning, so it uh, it wasn't too hot. But anyway, it was really great having folks back, and you can see kind of the way things had already developed by then. We talked a little bit earlier about the summer that we've had this year. It's um, we started out, you know, with a pretty nice spring, moist, you know, uh, cool to warm. Uh, more moderate temperatures or whatever. We we turned off really hot and dry late in July and early August, and then we had a little bit of more moderate weather with a little bit of rain, and and then back to the heat. And so it's been kind of up and down, but overall probably not quite as hot as what we have seen some summers. But it it's also been fairly humid, which is probably a good thing for some plants and not so good for others. So anyway, it's always a unique year and a unique trial year to to see how some of these uh, things do. I wanted to start out uh, talking about the, uh, the annual trials out in the field. And uh, we'll kind of go roughly in alphabetical order, but so we'll start off with Ageratum here. Um, this is Ageratum, and I'm gonna have to see if I can get rid of this. Well, anyway, I guess not. But anyway, this is Artist Blue from Proven Winners, um, which uh, has been a good uh, uh, standard for us over the years. And they've added a new color this year. This is uh, Artist Pearl. And uh, one of the things I like about this, this one is that you can see a lot of times the white ones, the, uh, the flowers get brown and then they, they look kind of unsightly, whereas this one tends to, to kind of grow up over that. Um, and we, we, kind of, we call that burying its own dead. So uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of what you get with this one, which is, a, which is an improvement, I think. We also had uh, lots of fun basil. Um, we've had the Everleaf Emerald Towers for a couple of years, and now we've got Everleaf Thai Towers, which is a new addition um, to that group this year. 
And um, let's, okay. With the, the still the with the spicy foliage, but also light to flower and and lots of foliage. Um, so it's so it's very good for cultivation and for maintaining it in a in a limited space. Um, we also have the uh, the amazel basil, which is a huge plant, uh, lots of big leaves. It's also light to flower and it's resistant to downy mildew. So this one is continuing to be a good performer for us. Um, looking at uh, at begonias, these are the the ones that we had in the shade. Um, the uh, the sun was pretty pretty rough on these this year, but the uh, we had some a uh, couple of the the doubles, the double up from proven winners, and this is the the red one. We also had a white one, and uh, you can see that they're doing quite well taking the heat, and we'll see them again in the containers where they're taking some sun as well. So anyway, there's the white one, nice compact plants, and they maintain their flowers well. We had a new color in the big series um, from uh, Benary, the, the, the companies that's, that's the king of begonia breeding. Um, we've got uh, big white uh, green leaf, which was, uh, which was a good addition. That's also held up fairly well in the sun, I have to say, as the big series does. So um, we'll, we'll say that as well. The um, megawatt series, uh, Pan American's contribution to the big leaf begonias, um, they've got a new improvement on their pink bronze leaf. Um, which is doing well, has a real nice presentation of the flowers there. And uh, also from Cicada, we, uh, I've done the Viking series a couple of times, but this was a new section of the series I hadn't tried before called the Explorers. And this is Rose on Green Leaf, but it has more of a spreading habit, and which I think is very interesting. So it doesn't get quite as tall and it kind of, kind of spreads a little bit, which I think is a really interesting thing. Nice for containers, could also be done in hanging baskets. Um, be good. Here's the red on green leaf. And then of course, we always include some whoppers as a standard um, from Pan American Seed, one of our Texas superstars. And uh, you know, this is, is kind of the poster child for the for sun tolerant uh, begonias. Uh, and and um, uh, also they do quite well in the shade, but they do get big. They're, they're not called whoppers for, for nothing. There's the rose green leaf. Okay, a new species that I haven't trialed in a long time. This is, um, uh, and I'm gonna have to get out of here. How do I? You just hit escape. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that way I can read the names. I don't remember the names as well as I used to, you know. Oh. <laughs> Aren't they this in is... the they're they're in the slide itself, right? Well, except the the little box up at the top um, oh. hides it when they're up at the top like that. You can drag so. the box down to the bottom. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right, let's do that. Okay, let's see how this works. All right, Calilophus ladybird sun glow. This thing has been doing really well and out in the full sun and heat and has flowered like this, you know, during the summer. So this is a great new addition and, and a good plant for Texas. Good, good tough species. Uh, the Canna Canova series. Um, we've had some of these in the past and I've included some of these just, um, uh, as, as good examples of what we've got. These always amaze me. Um, this is the um, uh, Canova Rose from Pan American. And uh, anyway, it, these are just, these are great plants. It always amazes me that you can get a plant like this by midsummer uh, with a four inch pot, from a four inch pot planted in the spring. All right, we've got a new improvement on Cleome. This is the sparkler mix. I call it sparkler 2.0 from Syngenta Flowers. And the big improvement on this is that um, it doesn't have a tendency to get the uh, yellowing on the lower leaves later in the summer. Um, it's continuing to flower during the summer and um, uh, doesn't get that naked look um, late in the summer. So that's a big improvement, I think. And, and I think uh, something to look forward to in the future as this, as this species continues to improve. Um, we had several coleus this year. Um, the Color Blaze and Color Blaze series, we had Newly Noir. And this one um, has a little bit of a, a, 
uneven habit or whatever and a few flowers towards the end of the summer. But with some judicious pruning, I think this is a good plant. And I think the big deal on this one is the unique color um, because it's that real dark purple and it maintains that color real nicely through the summer. We also had one called El Brido, um, which, which has uh, beautiful colors and maintains a good upright posture uh, during the summer. I like this one a lot. Also, the uh, Color Blaze Torchlight is a new selection with a good, uh, good mix of, of color there with the green edge. That's kind of a unique thing. One of my favorites that I include as a standard every year is in, in this series is Golden Dreams, um, which is really awesome. And a lot, of, a lot of people have really come to like this one a lot. And also one called Wicked Witch, which I, I have a tendency to grow every year. Um, this one I think is really interesting that it's so heat tolerant because that wavy edge you know, you would think of might be something that would burn, you know, in the sun, but it doesn't. It stands up to the heat quite well. From the Main Street uh, series, Ocean Drive, uh, this is one that's also been very nice over the past few years. And so I like to include a few of these as some comparisons to, to uh, look at the others with. And a very interesting coleus that we got this year that I, that I think of as, as mainly a shade plant, especially when I saw that fine foliage, um, but it's really surprised me. It, it, does, it does very well. Of course, this is in the shade, but I'll show it to you later in containers where it's getting some sun and it's doing quite well. Very unusual. Hey, Brent. Uh-huh. Uh, Kelly popped in with the question, said, are the coleus pinched during the growing season? No, they're not. We go ahead and let them. Now, they might have been pinched, you know, early on when we we're growing the plants before we put them in the field. Um, but we let them grow without pinching during the growing season because we also want to get a feel for how much they actually flower. And, and Doug had popped in, FYI, the Whopper series are Benari genetics that Pan Am has exclusive on. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. That's one reason yeah. I call Benari the king of begonia breeding. Their, their genetics are everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Great plant. Okay. And also on the Evolvulus, uh, this is uh, blew my mind. Proven Winters came out with an improvement of this Evolvulus a couple of years ago, and this is a new one called X Blew My Mind XL. And you can see uh, this is the original Blew My Mind, and then this is back to the XL. And uh, to me, the big difference here is there's a, there's more vigor here. It's a bigger, it's a little bit bigger plant. Um, I don't think there's that much difference in the flower size um, and flower productivity. Um, but it's a little bit bigger plant. So, you know, might be better for the landscape, whereas the other one might be better in containers. Um, I'm not sure if going forward, they're going to actually market both of these, but this, but this is a, a, a more uh, a vigorous plant. Also, we had uh, these entered again this year, Gallardia, the heated up, there's scarlet and also a yellow. And um, I like to see these out there because of all the Gallardias that are out there, this is a good one that will last late into the summer. Um, and continue to flower. Um, sometimes it helps to pinch some of the old flowers off um, when there's a lot of them, but, uh, but they do continue to produce new flowers late into the summer. Looking at geraniums, um, these are all under 30% shade, um, which is, I have found to be a really good way to um, uh, grow geraniums to get a good read on them here. Um, this one is called Mary Helen that I include as a uh, standard. Um, it's a pass along geranium that's been around. It was originally found by Mary down in the Rio Grande Valley. And, and, and now uh, she gave it to Helen, who has it in Victoria, Texas. And she gave it to Jerry Parsons and I got it from him. And so anyway, it's just one of those kind of plants um, that stands up to the heat really well. So anyway, good comparison. Uh, the Mojo series from Syngenta Flowers is something that I'm finding very interesting. This is one of the hybrids. Um, a lot, you know, very much like the calliopes and that sort of thing, except it has a fairly compact habit. And especially the dark red seems to have a lot of heat tolerance, um, especially for one that's not quite as vigorous as some of these other types. So anyway, and this is a, this is a shot from August. So, um, you know, when you're looking at geraniums in Texas, if you see something that looks like this, you know, we're, we're way impressed. So there you go. And here's the uh, caldera salmon. This is also a hybrid, but it's one that has a tendency to have more of an ivy leaf look to it. So if you want that kind of a look in a mixed container or, or um, hanging basket or something like that, this, this would be a great choice, um, continuing to bloom in the heat. And then also the Caliente series has been great. And this color in particular, the orange, 
um, is one that, um, that, that just does really well. I mean, to still be flowering like this as a geranium in August, I think is pretty, pretty amazing. Gomphrena truffula pink, another great entry that we've had before, but it continues to, to really show off its stuff. Uh, it's a great plant. And uh, in the world of uh, Helianthus, um, these are some annual types. And um, this, um, it's from the All America Selections. And so this is one of the trial entries. And one of the things that I found very impressive about this is first of all, it's stature, but also the fact that it's got a well-branched flower head. It's got really huge flowers. And you can see the multiple flowers that develop up there. Now, these are not going to continue all the way into late summer and fall as far as flowering goes, but they give, they give a very spectacular display and a lot of bang for your buck on this one. So I've really enjoyed that. Now the Sun Credibles, on the other hand, are going to flower later in the summer. This is a, this is a late summer picture taken recently. And uh, this is the new edition uh, called Saturn, which has the, um, the little ring in, in the flowers. And so you continue to get flower production late into the summer. And you can see all the flowers that have been there already. And this is the original Sun Credible yellow. A new uh, heliotropium that uh, was introduced this year is the Augusta lavender. And I'm absolutely amazed at the heat tolerance of this, especially with that flower color. Um, you just, this plant does not look like a plant that would stand up in the heat, but it certainly does. And I'll show it to you in containers in a little bit also. We tried the Impatience Beacon series again this year, and um, they are looking good. Of course, a full shade plant. Um, some of the colors flower uh, a lot heavier than some of the other uh, colors in the series. Uh, Beacon Salmon and the Beacon Coral, um, I think are the heaviest flowering ones that we have. A nice, uh, good vigorous but bushy uh, uh, habit that holds together. There's a uh, rose and also uh, violet shades. So anyway, these are, these are doing well. I don't have a lot of uh, downy mildew pressure here, so, um, but, it, but it does occur. And uh, these of course are reported to have uh, resistance to it. And so anyway, this is, this is something that uh, is bringing impatience, uh, standard impatience back into the realm of, of landscape use here. New Guinea hey, impatience, yes. I, I miss uh, Bill's question earlier, and I'm not exactly sure, Bill, what plants you're referring to. So you might type that in the chat box again. How widely available are these plants and when would these plants be available? So Bill, since I, you caught me uh, asleep at the wheel here, would you type in the name of the plant that you're interested in, then I'll pop back in and ask Brent. Well, I would answer that kind of in reference to most of the things that I'm showing you. A lot of the things that we have that are new are things that are going to show up in the market next spring. Um, some right. of the things yes. that we... He said, "Really, any of the plants?" So you you answered the question. Good. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that question all the time, and it's 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 a good question because you know we sit here and we talk about all these plants, but of course it's really hard sometimes to go down and find these at the garden center. You know, the whole idea of these trials is that we get information out there that growers and retailers can look at to help choose good things for their customers, so that so that when they do go looking for some of these things, hopefully they can find them. Um, so. Anyway, sometimes it is a little bit tough. You have to shop around. Um, so, but a lot of the things that are listed as new are basically introductions that are going to be on the market next spring. So those are things that, that growers and, and retailers are all looking at now so that they can make those kinds of decisions and book all of this stuff in advance so that they can be grown for sale next spring. So I hope that helps. Okay, on the New Guinea impatience, um, this is just kind of an overview of them. We've got some, a few new ones uh, this year. Uh, in the Sun Patience series, um, the compact, uh, this is a, a new one, uh, dark red. And a lot of times the compact ones are getting a lot better. In the past, a lot of times it's been the vigorous ones that we have been uh, looking at for heat tolerance because they have a little bit more vigor and stand up to the heat better. But the breeding is improving with these compact ones. This is a new dark red. The, this is a hot pink, which is still showing good flowering in the summer. Um, 
Compact Rose Glow, which has been a very good one also for flowering. And then um, new last year was Compact Orange and also this Compact Orchid Blush. And I tell you what, this Compact Orchid Blush, this is the second year in a row it's done this for me. And um, I this one is particularly heavy flowering and I think going to be kind of a, a standard for me going forward as far from the Compact group. In the Vigorous group, there is some a couple of new ones. Here's the, a new improvement on the Clear White. And you can see this is an improvement with the heavy flowering that we've got. Also got a vigorous sweetheart white, which I don't remember having one before with the little eye in it, which is kind of nice. Uh, we've also got uh, orange improved, which we had last year. And then one that I that I use as a standard within the vigorous group um, for several years is the is the shell pink. And this one has stood up in disease situations quite well in comparison to a lot of the other colors and different varieties that I've had in trials over the years. So this is one that I particularly recommend and, and like to include every year for comparisons. Here's an overview of ornamental sweet potato plots. We uh, named this a new Texas superstar this year as a, basically as a group. Um, as you can see, we had to put an electric fence up around these because the deer just absolutely relish these. They don't really bother anything else in the field, but they will eat these things to the ground. Um, so, so anyway, we had to put, put some protection up for them. Um, basically, there's a, as you know, there's a lot of ornamental sweet potatoes out there, and it it's just comes down to more of a matter of taste. Um, the Flora Mia series has a lot of different colors and shapes. Here's a lime and wedge. We've got uh, this Nero uh, has more of a dissected leaf with even a few flowers showing up here and there. One of my personal favorites is this Red Rosso, which has got um, multicolor in the foliage, which it, you know, and this, this stays, you know, all during the summer. And, and so that's, that's something that, that is just a real hallmark for this particular variety. This Solar Power Black is just amazing as far as how dark purple that it actually, and black purple, I guess you'd call it, um, it, it maintains that color during the summer and even in the heat. Um, which is really awesome. And then Spotlight Red, I do like the red ones too. Um, this one's very pretty. It's a little bit more, not quite as rampant a grower. And a lot of the new ones aren't quite as crazy growing as some of the older ones are. So they're good for, you know, they can be used in mixed containers and, and things like that. Uh, this is a new one in the Sweet Carolina series uh, called Medusa. It was new last year, actually. This is the second year we've had it. And I really like the fine texture on this one. And it's very interesting to me because it's a lime green one. It's got a little bit of color in that new foliage so that you don't get burning in the sun, in full sun. Uh, the lime green ones actually will take some shade um, and make a good, good shade ground cover for that matter. But this one holds up well in full sun as do a lot of them. This was also the first year that I got to try the Solar Tower uh, series. And there's a black one and a lime one. And as you can see, none of the sweet potatoes, as much as they ramble across the ground, they won't grow up. But these two will. And so we set up a trellis for them to grow up. Um, but we didn't put a deer fence up around these. And as you can see, they do clamber to the top of the trellis quite quickly. But uh, you can see where grazing height is on these things. Um, so anyway, if you're in a place with high high deer pressure, you're going to have to have they're going to have to have some protection, and this is the lime one. But anyway, this is way cool. They'll they'll actually climb and um, and so you can do a lot of fun things with that. Lantana is all, always a great plant for us, and um, we had some new ones that we got to trial this year. This is uh, one called Bloomify Orange, and uh, this is from. Um, Ball floor plant, and this series is uh, uh, certified to be sterile. And we've got um, the there were a couple of new colors this year. This was orange, and then this is the pink, kind of a moderate vigor, not a real big one, but not but also not as compact as some of the other ones that are out there as well. Um, the luscious series, uh, we berry blend is an, an, an entry that we've had before, performs well. This whole series is a, is a little bit bigger and 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 more vigorous type series. A new addition to the series this year is Citron. It's got a little bit little bit more compact habit, um, but these are still pretty big plants. Pretty cool, pretty big by the end of the season. Marmalade is another one. 
and uh and then the shamrock series is a new ser series that uh that we have this year and uh, so all of these colors are new and this one's again kind of inter uh, intermediate in size a little smaller than the bloomifies but larger than the lucky series for example um this is peach rose white which is looks to be a little bit more compact than some of the other ones in the series so but anyway a good new series it's always nice to see new lantanas make it out onto the market um i grow a few peppers um i i value them for their ornamental as well as their culinary use um this one fits the bill in both ways um i love this name um candy cane chocolate cherry and i you can you can uh you can see the variegated foliage. You've got kind of a striped look on the fruit. You also get these uh, the coloring developing later as they ripen. You can see that color peeking out right there. So anyway, there's just a lot of things to uh, to, to recommend with this plant. The Mad Hatter is, I believe, was new last year or the year before, but is a great one. And you can see the fruits here. They've got They've got a really funky shape and, and beautiful colors. This is really beautiful in the fall when you get a lot of fruit on there and they color up. And um, they, they taste good as well. This is a, a sweet type pepper. Uh, a new one this year is the Potopeno. And uh, this one's kind of fun. It's a, it's a mild jalapeno, and, but, the, but the stems grow fairly horizontal. You can see out over here and you can see the fruits are green and, and they eventually get red. Um, but you can see how they develop, which produces a lot of possibilities here. You can do um, hanging baskets with these, containers, um, but you can also grow them in the ground, obviously. And so anyway, very versatile plant um, to a pepper that's widely used. We had this, uh, the Rudbeckia Amarillo Gold was new a couple of years ago. It's a more compact Rudbeckia. This one would, would probably also be a really excellent container plant. And then we also grew out the Sonora Denver Daisy. I saw a lot of this planted in Denver. Imagine that. Great plant. Beautiful in the landscape up there. Um, and, and also one of my all time favorites is Prairie Sun, which is a bigger, bigger, bulkier one. And these these bloom pretty late into the summer. You know, by by early September, they're going to be, you know, looking the worst for the heat. But um, but at the same time, you just get many, many weeks of color from these things. And they're really they're awesome plants for us. Uh, Scavola, we've got Sardiva Blue, Violet, um, also the Fashion Pink. These are some fairly nice, strong colors, good habit, good flowering. I'm, I'm more and more impressed with this series. Um, as we go, they had an improvement on the white this year, which has a really awesome habit and has maintained its flowering uh, like this during the summer. And I just am reminded when we first got Scavola years ago, that it was something that we would only do in containers that they didn't really like being in the ground and boy have we come a long ways um, there's just a lot of a lot of cool stuff out there now and and this is a good series uh terenia highlight mix um i've thought of as terenia in the past as being more of a shade plant but um i i they've they grow in the sun and and this one's doing quite well so new introduction from syngenta flowers this is the mix also some um some some vinca this year uh the blockbusters um these aren't brand new but these uh were from florinova which was um uh, combined uh syngenta flowers bought them and so so this is one of the series that's uh that's in the company now and they're it's a nice big bold plant um this is the red the dark red which is a which is a very good red uh, i think one of the better reds on the market um Got also, of course, got the Cora XDR series, um, the our Texas superstar with with highly uh, known for its disease resistance, and uh, putting Vinca kind of back on the landscape map map in the South. Um, we've got the Deep Strawberry, which is a really good one. This one, this one, this color in particular has been has been a good one, and then we've also got the Valiant series, which also has. Um, resistance to aerial phytophthora and this is the apricot which was improved uh, which was introduced last year and then we've got the valiant burgundy nice again big bold plants big flowers and then another thing that i i uh, i just i grow these every year because it's always hard for me to believe that they perform as well as they do when i first saw these with the little bitty flowers i was just kind of what is this 
and and then after you grow them grow them out you you realize um you know the the flower power that these things have and it's really pretty amazing but at the soiree kawaii series from suntory and these are some of the um individual colors a couple of them were new last year so um, we grew them out again this year the blueberry kiss um, this is coral, which has been around for a while, one of my favorites. And then coral reef was a new one last year. <clears throat> it's a little bit, it's more compact than coral. And so probably more useful as a mixed container, though they can all be used in containers quite nicely. And this is lavender, light purple, and red shades. Peppermint, you can do red, white, and blue with these things now. They've got enough of the colors. So anyway, it's a, it's a pretty fun series. In the Grand, uh, Grand Flora type zinnias, uh, the Preciosa series was new last year. This year, the orange standalone, as a standalone color, was new. It was only available in a mix last year. These have done well. We wait and plant these late in the season um, when it's starting to get hot. And that way, we avoid some of the disease issues. These hold up well through the summer. By late summer, of course, they're Grandiflora zinnias, and so they're going to start getting some of the leaf spot and powdery mildew and that sort of thing. Um, that they do, but they but they hold up they hold up well in the heat. There's the scarlet and the yellow, and there's several other colors um, that look look great. I think one of the hits of the year is the the new color in the Zinnia Profusion series. Um, this is red and yellow bicolor, and what I find really fun about this um, is um, the fact that these are the fresh flowers down here, and then they fade to this color. Which is which is a, a nice color and and even more to, to colors like this. So <clears throat> later in the season, instead of seeing old flowers, you basically get a mixture of all these different colors, and so it's a pretty pretty cool thing. And I think I think this is going to be one that that really stands out. So hopefully you'll get to see see that in the market next spring. Uh, also, um, that one is a uh, All America selection winner, and and so hopefully that will also make it, uh, get it out there so that you can find it. Uh, Profusion Double Red, nice uh, non-fading red that held up well. Uh, double Hot Cherry is another one that, that's doing well. We're doing a lot better with the breeding on these as far as not getting fading on the flowers, which is great. In the Zahara series, we, we grew out some of the doubles. This is the Double Cherry, double yellow and double salmon. Um, I believe these were new introductions last year. And um, so anyway, good plants and, and uh, was nice to be able to take another look at them this year. Okay, from the field, we're gonna move into the uh, container trials. And uh, this is the a new Budlia series. Whoops, well, I'll show you that in just a minute. Let's start out here. I wanted to mention the uh, kitchen minis. Um, this is Siam. These are grown in quart pots. This is an interesting, this is a container tomato. This is not meant to go out in the garden. It's meant to go on your windowsill, on your patio, something like that. You pick tomatoes for, for three to five weeks and then, and then you throw it away and get a new one. And uh, it's an interesting concept and they're quite tasty and they've been quite popular locally. I, I grew some of these out um, because I wanted to, to see how some of the different ones do. So anyway, a lot of fun. We've got a new uh, Budlia series called the Chrysalis series, um, which I'll show you when we talk about perennials, I've got some in the ground, but I have a whole lot better luck with Budlia in containers for some reason than I do in the ground. And this is a pretty awesome new series. As you can see, they look great in containers. They're a little bit more compact. Um, this is uh, Chrysalis blue. And we've got um, this one pink on the left and cranberries on the right. Then we've got uh, uh, <clears throat> a new series of Delosperma, the Ocean Sunset series. Delosperma has been doing well. Um, it, uh, it overwinters well, and, but it does a lot better in containers. Again, this one needs to be up where it's got really good drainage and that sort of thing. So it's a great succulent from that standpoint. We mentioned earlier the Evolvulus, and if you look on the left here is the new XL, and on the right is the, is the uh, original blew my mind. And so you can see a little bit more vigor in the, in the XL plants. So same as what I was showing you on the field locations, but great container plants. Um, also another look at Gomfrina truffula pink, which looks good in containers. A couple of the Mandevilla Sun Parasol series that I hadn't grown before. This is Garden White and Crimson. Got a close up of the flowers. These flowers are really large. Uh, they're bushy plants, not so much they don't have a tendency to, to vine. 
um, very much. So that's kind of nice for containers. And also the flowers don't burn in the sun. <clears throat> Close up of the flowers there. And then the, the uh, Soiree Kauai a series of Vinca again, and this is what they look like in containers, which is a great way to use them. Cool plants. Looking at some of the things that we've had in the shade, um, this is an ajuga called Blueberry Muffin. It's real small foliage, and I was really interested in trialing this one out where we could see what kind of winter hardiness we have and what kind of flowering we would get in a container. Um, also, we've um, the uh, double up uh, red and white um, begonias, these are doing well in shade as well as in um, the half day sun or partial sun trial where basically they get morning sun and afternoon shade being up next to the greenhouse like that. And so they're taking a half a day of sun very well. In the shade, I've had um, a really nice experience this year with the heuchera. And um, so the uh, a lot of the ones, I've got them in the ground, but they really do well in containers. And you, these are three of the new ones from Darwin Perennials, um, a couple from the Carnival series and Big Top Caramel Apple. And you can see these, these vigorous ones are really doing well. Um, and But even the ones that don't have a lot of vigor do well in containers. Oh, I did something. All right, sorry guys. That was unusual. I hadn't seen that one before. Okay, now we're back. <laughs> okay, and then and then I got several uh, heucheras also from Terra Nova this year. They all they have some awesome uh, heucheras in their portfolio and uh, a grand grande amethyst, which has a lot of vigor. So this is I think going to be a good one for our heat. And then several from the Northern Exposure series. Um, some of the different colors you can see. We've also got, uh, there's silver on the left, which is the rest of that series, and then, and then one called Rio and one called Paris. So anyway, this is a lot of fun, and I will keep these over the winter. This is one called Steel City from Must Have Perennials that we had last year, and we kept it through the winter. It survived the Snowmageddon, and, and then we got these flowers in the spring. So anyway, it's, very, it's, it's an awesome plant too. But heucheras do very well in containers for us. Here's the coleus monkey puzzle, and this is actually in the partial sun trial. So we've got a half a day of, uh, of sun here, and it's, it's standing up quite well. I've been playing around a little bit with dahlias over the years. This is a mystic illusion, and this one has done very well in the garden. I've had it for about three years now, and so I tried it in containers. This is kind of a late planting. It's a little bit tall for a container, but... but um, so we had to stake it up a little bit, but it really survives the heat well and continues to bloom all summer. Um, this is from the XXL series. Um, and, and you can see that it's not quite flowering yet. Uh, again, it was a late planting because I was looking at pot size as far as establishment on these things. And we've got one from the City Light series and also one from the Delea series. I'm really expecting these to burst into bloom this fall and to make quite the show. Um, right now they're building a big plant and what's what's interesting to me is that they are tolerating the heat as far as building a plant. So um, anyway, they're, the dahlias are becoming more and more heat tolerant and so these are some good examples of those. We had some new colors in the Color Bloom uh, Gerbera series and again this is a container. Um, <coughs> a series of Gerber are really meant for containers as opposed to being in the ground. And then this is the heliotropium that I showed you earlier that was um, uh, in the ground. So very heat tolerant, looks great in a container. This heliopsis has looked really good in a container. I planted some in the ground and unfortunately I have a lot of uh, pill bugs in my demonstration garden and they love this plant. Uh, to the point that it, they just basically completely destroyed it. And, but when I put it in the container and got it out, I got to see what it would really do. And it's, it's very nice. So anyway, this is a, this is a cool plant. James Bretonia, this is a, I, I kind of struggle with this uh, with, I think it's our heat and humidity, probably better in an arid environment, but this, the, the new safaris here are, uh, are doing well. 
So I was impressed with those. And then I've also been playing around with a couple of things in clay pots, things that like good drainage. And uh, this Dianthus, uh, this is Olivia Cherry from, from Doom and Orange. Um, these plants do well in containers. They stand up to the cold. Um, they need a little bit of protection in severe cold, but you know, and then you get, you get good flowering with these, but they get the good aeration at the roots. And so, so they have a tendency to be longer lived. Uh, another plant that, that I, is responding well to this is uh, Salvia Lancelot. This is a way cool plant and we really enjoy this. It's got kind of the fuzzy leaves, but this is a plant that's gonna like a more arid environment too. As you get over to Interstate 35 corridor, you're gonna get probably a little bit better response on this plant, but I also think growing it in clay pots or in raised beds where you've got really good drainage is, is gonna be the way to go with this. Um, lavender, of course, do well in this situation also. So anyway, that's been kind of fun and something I've been kind of playing with the last couple of years. We used to have nothing but clay pots and then all of a sudden all we did was plastic and but clay has its place. And I think, I think it can be very useful in certain situations. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's also talk about perennial trials. Um, we've expanded our perennial beds over the last three or four years. And, and so we've had, um, we've had some really interesting trials. I wanted to start off by showing you some of these different uh, salvia nemorosa type um, plants that we have. And I'm gonna move that over here. There we go. And uh, this is a uh, salvia April night blue. This one's not going to bloom all summer, but it does make a good show. It blooms earlier, um, whereas, well, I did it again. Uh, it's still salvia on the okay. screen. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is salvia May night blue, and. Um, Anyway, this has been kind of an industry standard and it blooms like this in the spring, but then it goes out of bloom and it's out of bloom for the rest of the summer. So that's kind of a problem. This Lyrical Blues has been a good one and uh, it continues to bloom through the summer. So I've been really pleased with it. Um, it's, it's been a good performer and it's a little bit more compact. And then of course, there's the Salvia Blue by you, which is the one that kind of sparked my interest in this area. Um, but we've had these in the ground for about three years now. This one continues to be also one of the best ones. It reblooms during the summer. It, it can use some deadheading at times um, to clean it up and to encourage more blooming. And especially if you do that in late summer, you just get an absolutely spectacular fall display. But this is what it looks like early in the spring continues to bloom in the, in, the, in the summer, but you can see that it's blooming as early as the iris and, um, you know, while we still have pansies in the ground and that sort of thing. So anyway, it's just, it's a white cool plant. We've had some of this amaryllis in the ground for several years. Now, this is one called Eyecatcher from Abbott Ipco, and this is probably one of the best performers that we've had. Um, so it's a new perennial amaryllis that, that seems to be perfectly hardy for us. We've also, uh, from, from them, we've had the, uh, these lilies. It's from the American series. And these are um, um, LA hybrids uh, from that group of lilies breeding. And uh, anyway, the American series, this is American native. Um, we've got American warrior and uh, American heroes in the front there, the yellow one. And these are just really unbelievably good lilies for Texas. Um, I started with from some of the, well, the ones you're looking at, I started from a single, each one of those clumps from a single bulb that I picked up at a garden show in Galveston um, a number of years ago. And they just keep getting bigger and bigger and um, they bloom for several weeks and, and kind of uh, late spring into early summer. And so anyway, it's just, it's something to look forward to every year. And I, you know, you think you can't do lilies in Texas. Well, yes, you can. So there are, there are some um, to help expand the small palette that we already had. Uh, Baptisia alba is a perennial that's been, that I've had for several years. And as you know, Baptisias take a long time to get established. And, and this is what they can look like if you give them the time to do it. Um, this is another one from the Decadence series, Deluxe Pink Lemonade, more compact, of course, but the colors are beautiful and you can see how it's established over the years and just makes a spectacular show in the spring. Um, uh, Achalia, the Millie Rock series, is something that uh, Darwin Perennials has been adding colors to. This is the latest one, the yellow, um, which came back out. This is in its second year this year, um, so it was new when we planted it last year. We've also got a couple of leucanthemums that are, these are also in their second year, um, where we really get to see what they can do. This is Sunshine Freak, 
And then we also have one called white cap um, that perform very well. These are not long lived perennials, but you do get some first year flowering and then you get a really nice display the second year. And we'll see, we'll see how they do uh, as we go into another year. Uh, we've got a lot of echinaceas that do well, um, are well for us. And I, I say that from the standpoint of a lot of the more recent breeding of echinaceas. I used to get real frustrated with them, but some of the new stuff coming out on the market has been really cool and is, it's a short-lived perennial at best, but they're lasting a lot longer and giving us a, a, a much more spectacular floral display than, than what we got in the past. This Jack Quisenberry is one that I keep around as a standard. It's a seed strain that I got from a master gardener from Smith County who works on the Overton project. And um, anyway, it's just, it's a really good one. And then uh, another thing I wanted to explain with echinaceas is that, you know, we'll plant them the first year and we get some flowering, um, especially from the vegetative types, um, maybe not as late as some of the seed strains because it just takes them longer to develop. But um, anyway, this is what we'll get during the first year. And then during the second year, we'll get a more spectacular display. So anyway, this is, this is Kismet White from Terra Nova. And we've also got Caramia Yellow. And I'm really expecting these to pop out of the ground and look great next year. Um, these are some that are in their second year. And this is an interesting one called uh, Echinacea Lovely Lolly. Down here, the big double one, you can see some uh, uh, detail on the flowers up here. And so anyway, again, they're in their second year and I really wasn't expecting them to do that well, I have to admit, because, because it's a very unusual one and a lot of this type don't tend to do that well, but they came out and really out, for, outdid themselves. So anyway, I was pleased to see that. Um, we've had some of the uh, Echinacea Sombrero series into their third year and a couple of the colors that have really stood out are the uh, Sombrero Tres Amigos and we've also got the Sombrero Flamingo Orange. And uh, anyway, this is a really beautiful, bright color and, uh, and one that's come back very well for us. Also this year, um, uh, Kieft is developing some of these bright colors from seed. Um, this is a little past its prime, but you can see that they're blue. This is a picture that was rec very recently taken. And you can see from the developing, um, starting them from seed this year, we did get flowering. But then next year, I expect this to be pretty spectacular. We do have some, in fact, this is, this is some that's in its second year. This is the soft orange, and then this is the red umber. Um, and uh, so anyway, you can see what, you know, during the first year, we have smaller plants, we get some flowering. In the second year is when you really get, get a really spectacular show. So anyway, this is pretty cool. Now, with production, you might be able to start some of these from seed earlier um, and get a little bit bigger. Um, earlier flowering plant, you know, in a gallon or something like that. But this based on my experience of starting these things from seed in like February, early February. So, um, so anyway, you can, you know, there's probably some production schemes that could be worked on there. But um, anyway, my, the thing I'm happy about is the fact that these are giving us good landscape performance over, you know, more than a couple of years. So, and then this is a, uh, another, um, experimental here, apex mix from Benary, the good sturdy plants, again from seed. And, and so we're getting a lot of these bright colors into some of our new, uh, new mixes that are out there. So that's a pretty cool thing. All right, let's move on and talk about Phlox. I've got a couple of them that I wanted to show you. Um, this is Phlox Mini Pearl, which is a, I think it's a tri-specific hybrid. It was found on the roadside in the south. Um, and anyway, this is a way cool plant. It blooms very early. You can see it's blooming with the uh, early roses and uh, it, it blooms for several weeks like this. It doesn't rebloom during the summer, but it, it does have a spectacular long lived show um, in, in late spring. And then this is one called Cloudburst, which also is giving us a lot of color. And then moving on to some of the garden flocks, this is one that I have uh, really enjoyed um, this Kapow series. And this is something that I'm becoming more and more impressed with because I've got some that have been in the ground. Um, they're on their third growing season now. And, and they're continuing to get bigger and better. And, and that's a pretty amazing thing for garden flocks. You know, John Fanick, for example, is one of the few garden flocks that actually does that in Texas. And so we've got the Kapow series. This is soft pink. This is a new color. And this is what they look like in the first year. You're getting, you know, relatively early flowering, but they flower up into the summer. They'll rebloom well. And then um, during the second year is when you start to get, um, you know, the big 
shows. This is a Kapow white bicolor, and you can see how much uh, more, more show and vigor that you get with these and during the second year. And uh, this is a June, late June, uh, where there's, they're getting into good flower. And then this is something that was just taken a couple of weeks ago, same, same plants. And so you can see how many weeks of flowering you get even through the heat of the summer with these things. So they're really pretty awesome. This is Kapow Pink, which is in its third year of growth. And this is a, this is a, a late summer shot, um, looking great. Giving us a good show. This is, uh, and then there's the Super Kapows also. Um, this is a Kapow Pink, and that, that was in late June. This is, again, is in August. And so you can see, again, the length of the blooming period that we're getting with these and the fact that they stand up to the weather, they look, they look good. Um, this is Kapow Lavender. Also very attractive to the swallowtail butterflies and all different kinds of butterflies, actually hawk moths, and they're just a lot of fun to watch. And let's see if I can get this to play. There you go. Anyway, that's very, that's a lot of fun. Very cool, Brent, very cool. So the, um, the buddleias that I was talking about early in containers, this is what they look like in the ground. And uh, this is a uh, chrysalis blue. And uh, you can see the more compact nature of these things. This is chrysalis pink. Um, they do have uh, some of the older flowers, but these are continuing to produce new flowers um, and that kind of hide some of the old flowers. And so anyway, that's um, I'm, I'll, I'll be real interested to see how these go through the winter and what they look like next year. But uh, so far, so good on, on some of these. Um, also, um, a new Artemisia, uh, the Sun Fern series. This is the one called Arcadia. And when I first saw this and they said, put it in full sun, I was like, really? And but I did, and they look great. And so I think this is a very interesting addition to, this is something you could use as an edging. It's not like a crazy spreading thing, um, but it, um, it obviously beautiful foliage, which can be used as a foil to all kinds of flowers. You could use these in containers. Um, so anyway, I think, I think it's, a, it's a very interesting addition to, uh, to the type of foliage plants that we can use here in the, in the hot full sun. Some other things we've been playing around with also are some of these Carexes. Um, this is Carex divulsa. And I think these are real interesting for more natural looking landscapes um, and, and something that, um, that I think a lot of people are interested in. Uh, the, only, the only real complaint I have about these is if you get a lot of nutgrass growing in a bed of these, it is a pain trying to find the nutgrass and get it out. Because <laughs> sometimes it's hard to tell apart, but at the same time, when the nutgrass gets big, you can definitely see it's there. So anyway, this is Carex texensis, which is a little bit more delicate type, um, but it's one that's native to the, native to the state. Uh, Carex tumulicola. And uh, anyway, as you can see, these are a little bit different habit, a little bit different size, but a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting um, grassy type foliage that can be used to support other plantings, especially in a mixed, um, you know, more naturalized look, looking landscape. Uh, we've also been looking at some lomandras. This is part of the, our superstar trials. Uh, Mike Arnold got some of these for us. This is one called Katrina Deluxe. Um, it's very clumping. Um, Again, a little bit of an issue with trying to keep the nutgrass out of these things, but um, uh, this is one called Breeze, which I, is one of my favorites. It's a very fine texture and has a very nice natural look to it. And then also some uh, Dianellas. This is one called King Alfred that I think has a nice, a nice stiff upright appearance um, and, and something. These all went through, the, through this past winter we had. We measured uh, minus four degrees Fahrenheit um, here at Overton. And so I was impressed with the cold hardiness. Though we did have a snow, we had snow cover, but, but still it was minus four. So uh, some uh, new colors of, of, well, our new Paquito series from, of Agastache uh, from Terra Nova. This is the orange and the butter yellow. A lot of times these plants kind of melt away from, for me, um, but this is a pretty good raised bed. And also these seem to be taking the heat very well and they're continuing to bloom during the heat of the summer too. Um, which is which is a good thing. This is something that has kind of surprised me. I've had this for several years now, so I thought I would mention it. It's Eupatorium euphoria ruby, 
and it's it's kind of a dwarf eupatorium that you know the the joe pie weed gets pretty tall and this one is is a lot lot more controlled in its growth and everything so anyway this is a this is kind of a fun addition um, and a nice form of that particular plant. And I was, I am pleased to see that it's as heat tolerant as it is. Okay, these are some of the heucheras that I was talking about earlier. And um, you can see uh, some of these, some of the ones that don't have quite as much vigor are struggling a little bit here. Um, and there's another shot of it there. But if you have them in full shade, they're doing pretty well in the ground. So I'm really, really curious to see how these things are going to go through the winter. And um, uh, But they're standing up to the heat fairly well. I did have another, a second area where I planted these that got a little bit of midday sun because I just wanted to see, you know, quite, you know, how much you could give them. And that they're not doing well at all. So you really do need to have these in full shade, but in a very nice, well-prepared bed, you know, with good, even moisture. And um, so anyway, there's a lot you can do with these. And again, they look great in containers. Uh, some roses that are looking good. This is a rose called Gay Hammond. Um, this is a, a very tough rose and it stands up and, and has a great, uh, great constitution, beautiful flowers. And uh, anyway, named after a great friend. And so, so anyway, what, what else can you say good about a rose? That's a nice one to have. These True Bloom roses, we've been trying some of those, and a couple of those have really caught my eye. This True Friendship and True Passion, they both have really good, healthy, disease-tolerant foliage, and that, that's something that is so important in a rose. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, these are two, I think, of the best of, the, of that group. Um, definitely some good stuff here. I also wanted to mention these peonies. These are Ito peonies. And I have had these for several years now. And they, they have become nicely established in the ground. I've also grown them in containers. But these are crosses between tree peonies and, and um, herbaceous peonies. And, and so you get a little bit, well, kind of the good of both worlds. First of all, they don't require as much chilling. So we get some decent flowering on them here. You can see all the buds on this one. Um, and also they're really quite lovely. And if they're grown in shade, the flowers, um, especially deciduous shade, the shower, the, the flowers are protected a little bit from the sun and they'll last a little bit longer. <coughs> and they continue to get bigger and these are very, very long lived perennials. So anyway, again, this is more of a high end niche type market um, for something like this. This one's called Kiko. And then we've got another one here called Misako, which are two of the best ones. Um, that I've that I've had and so um, anyway just really beautiful plants and they continue to come back so I've been very pleased with these um, but they're very expensive and it takes them you really have to give them two or three years in the ground um, before you uh, can see what they'll do but very worth the investment so avid gardeners um, this is a great plant Salvia darcii is a, a salvia that we've had, a perennial that we've had for years. Um, and it's a hummingbird magnet. It blooms a lot in the spring and then it'll kind of go out of bloom in the summer, but then come back into bloom spectacularly in the fall. Um, so it's really an awesome plant and one that we're taking a look at for Texas Superstar. And that's a close up of the flowers. It's a really fun plant. And speaking of Texas Superstar, I wanted to go through and just give you a couple of the things that we have been looking at for 2021, the promotions that we did this year. Uh, we did the Celebrity Tomato, um, which is one that we've, that's been out there for a long time. We just had never promoted it. We also are, uh, have promoted Pavonia or Rock Rose, which is a great, uh, great plant, uh, very tolerant to our, our um our climate and uh, very much at home in, in these uh, natural type landscapes, close up of the flowers. We also, the supply on Napier grass, black stockings, um, finally got up to where we could promote it. That's it, the tall one. And the reason we promoted this is because from a four inch pot, you can get a 12 foot plant in one growing season. And that is pretty awesome. This is what they look like up in Lubbock at the trials. And you can see how tall they are. The other thing, uh, we promoted this year were the ornamental sweet potatoes, as I mentioned earlier, and just a few more examples of some of the different types. Uh, Dasana bronze, again, some from the Flora Mia series. You can see the different leaf shapes. There you go. Lots of beautiful solar power red, another good red one also. 
We also promoted rosemary, we're calling it barbecue skewers. It's the variety Garizia. And this is basically has a very upright habit and you can, you can cut these stems and strip the leaves off and then use them, as, soak them in water and then use them as skewers um, to, to put things on the grill. So anyway, it's pretty cool. It's very nice, very upright growth habit. And then we're uh, promoting this fall Texas super sweet onions um, for fall and winter. So that promotion will be coming out pretty soon. So, okay, Charlie, I'm gonna stop there. Awesome, all right. So we have been uh, monitoring all the questions. Um, there was just one comment that uh, Doug Perry had mentioned said about their echinacea is called pollination, pollination mix. Uh, Apex is our tre seed treatment from Benari. Benari. Oh, I apologize. Thank yeah. you for correcting me. Pollination mix. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see Sven's on in the house too. He, he said, thanks Brent for everything. Sven Svensson. So good to have you online, Sven. So if there's any other questions, folks, you can type that in the chat box. Um, I'm going to give you one more opportunity. I just put the URL where the handout is going to, uh, is already and where the recording of this webinar is going to be as well. Now, if you pre-registered, which obviously you did to be here, you'll be getting a link to um, the, the URL that'll have the recording to it. So that'll probably take me uh, just as soon as it's uh, through um, doing its thing in the Zoom iCloud, then I will put that on the website and it'll be ready to go. Uh, Bill, Bill Swantner says, unfair question, but I'll ask, going into fall, what would be your, Brent, what, Brent, what would you be your top five must-have landscape plants that are heat and drought tolerant? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Your top five. Well, if I'm, if I'm thinking in terms of things that are just being used for fall, um, that would be things like, I think, the, the zinnias. Uh, Grandiflora zinnias are really great in the fall. It's a way to avoid um, some of the disease issues and you get color for weeks and weeks. I think um, uh, also marigolds, um, we call them merry moms in the Texas Superstar program and the, you know, the big African types especially um, do quite well and they're becoming more and more popular for like, for example, the Day of the Dead holiday and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of these things can be in ground or whatever. Um, I think that um, that salvia darcii is a really cool thing that um, that I mentioned. It's very drought tolerant, and it, along with um, and these are things that is in terms of perennials that would be in the ground. That and then the Texas aster, Texas oblongifolius, um, growing those together is a really beautiful uh, show in the fall. So, so that's a lot of fun. I also think ornamental peppers are really great. Um, because they give you a lot of color um, and even any of the like the peppers we talked about in the program today um, those are great going into the fall and for for growers they can grow them in the heat of the summer and then you've got them available you know to give you that color and and um, you've got the <coughs> double use ornamental and culinary yeah all right very cool well, the rest of the comments uh, in the chat box, Brent, are thanking you for a great presentation. Let me chime in with my, uh, my kudos to you as well for a great presentation, as you always do. So, uh, folks, thank you very much for being here today. Again, you'll be getting a link to the URL where you can um, view the webinar numerous times if you want to in order to check uh, Brent's comments on a particular plant and you've got the handout. Brent, thanks so much, man. The outstanding Thank you. job as usual. I always learn so much and I, I see these things and, and yet it's, uh, you add a new spin to it. So I appreciate that. Well, thanks. It, it's, been, it's been a great pleasure doing it. I enjoy it. Yeah. Awesome. All right, folks. Thanks again. Talk soon.